Is this? All right. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming to this event. And um, yeah, we, we're really, <laughs> really happy so many people came this evening. Um, if you don't know Greg Reznovski, he's um, been travelling both North and South Islands um, and speaking to the councils and the local people uh, who have organised uh, the, the protests and have organised speaking events such as this um, regarding the 12-point resolution, uh, which is to be adopted by our council soon, hopefully. Um, and, yeah, we're going to be... Right now, he's going to be um, just doing a workshop with us. Um, and, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Cheers, thank you. <laughs> Um, greetings, everyone. Um, and I've got to turn this on. I've got some instructions. Right, and that's good. Um, we'll just do a little test to make sure everyone's happy, particularly Zana. She's happy. Okay. Um, my name's Greg. The surname's Rezin Um I'm a resident, or was a resident, of the Motuaka Valley. I'm, I'm, I, I currently list my address as 1 Tilk Tinkerbell Lane, wherever I am, because my little van's called Tinkerbell, you see. So if I'm in Palmerston North, I'm 1 Tinkerbell Lane in Palmerston North. If I'm here in Tauranga and I need to fill out a form or do something, I'm 1 Tinkerbell Lane here, because I've got a fixed address at the moment. I'm just moving around the countryside. Um, I was living in the Machuaca Valley, um, but um, the arrangement I had with the people there where I was supposed to be looking after their farm had fallen apart um, because I was away from the place all the time. And, and so they said, oh, Greg, we need to find someone else. So, <laughs> so Greg's travelling around. OK, so what this is about is a trans-Pacific partnership agreement. And um, so I'll just give you a rough idea of what that's about and then we'll talk about some of the implications from that. Um, it's an agreement that's being negotiated between 12 nations, uh, including New Zealand, Australia, uh, Vietnam, Mal Malaysia, uh, Brunei, Singapore, uh, Japan, um, Canada, the USA, Mexico, uh, Chile and Peru. And these countries are gathering together and the negotiators are trying to reach an, a settlement whereby there be a new set of rules for trading and for a whole number of other things right, between those countries. And it's interesting that this is taking place at a time when there's a similar set of negotiations taking place between the USA and Europe called the Trans, um, Transatlantic Trade and Investment uh, Partnership. And there's also another one that's going on between Canada and Europe and then there's another big one between in Europe, um, in Asia, uh, Eurasia, which we've got a bit of an interest in, um, which is being negotiated between China, India, and other nations there. Okay, and our interest in that is as if TPP falls over, according to our minister Tim Grosser, well then there's other things that we can go and attach ourselves to. Okay, in terms of free trade agreements. So they've definitely got a strong interest in locking us in to a free, a large multilateral free trade agreement. And their reasoning for that is because New Zealand is a trading nation. A lot of our income that um, we get benefit from comes from our trading relationships uh, with other nations. Um, <coughs> though that's not the be all and end all of our economy. Because our economy uh, is in the order of approaching $200 billion a year and the actual trade between New Zealand and the other nations is only a small portion of that overall number. Um, in respect to the, um, the TPP, the negotiations have been going on for um, approximately five years now, since about 2010. And it grew out of an earlier agreement which is called the P4. Now, there's a paper on the table there that Marty might get up and grab hold of, okay? 
and that's the TPP document for all local government and he might be able to give, no not, th oh yeah, and there might be enough to just about go all the way around because there's about 35 people here, I made 30 copies so, um, you got that one? It's seven pages, TPP document all local government. No, that's another one. Sorry? Uh, yeah, 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 that could be it. Hang on a sec. I'm just going to run down there for a second. So what, what Marty's going to give you first is a copy of a document that we circulated to all uh, local government in 2013. And, which I might not have a copy here amongst my papers, but that's okay, because um, I wrote it. Um, so what's happened is, is the TPP negotiations mean a number of things for us because we, in these negotiations... Um, particularly from large US corporation interests, are being asked to agree to a whole number of things. Now, the problem that the public have in all of this is, is we don't know exactly what's going on, right? It's the things being negotiated in secret. Um, but we do have a clue in relationship to we can see what's been negotiated in other free trade agreements and so we can then sort of extrapolate and say, uh, and say, all right, well, this is happening in, in the TPP or is likely to be. And we also know that the, the interests that are being driven out of the USA, um, they are being pushed by large corporate interests who effectively um, are driving the US agenda, right, in respect to these negotiations, Okay. So the, the large US corporations that might be driving things would be corporations like Warner Brothers, right? large media companies, large, um, large corporations interested in um, pharmaceuticals, large corporations interested in agriculture, Monsanto for instance. Uh, other large corporations that are interested in you know, a whole host of different things which supply commodities into the New Zealand and other nations' markets. And what they are saying is, is that they want alterations or to change the, 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 the domestic situation in regard to uh, what we're doing here in New Zealand. For instance, they're asking for an increase in, in intellectual property or copyright rules. Okay? So... When copyright was originally developed, going back, you know, when they developed the press and all the rest of it, copyright was formalised as the death of the author plus 14 years. Okay? So anyone who held the copyright, right, um, they, could, they would have unrestricted access to whatever the content is, the intellectual property, for the life of the author plus 14 years. So that could be the the publishing company that got them to sign a contract or whatever else. Now, over the course of time, these large corporations that own publishing have locked it all up and um, effectively authors have to sign, authors, musos, etc., have to sign their life away, sign a contract, the corporation owns the IP and now the IP is out to 50 years. Right? The copyright rules are out to the author's death plus 50 years. What these large corporations are now asking for in TPP, for instance, is to us agree to extend it out to 70 years. Right? They just want more and more and more. Now, the same goes in respect to pharmaceuticals. Right? Now, Pharmac, right, 
is an organisation which the large corporations in the USA just do not like. Right? Okay? It's a state-owned enterprise um, and what they see it as socialist medicine. Okay? And they don't like that right? because it is a powerful entity and can negotiate from a position of power with pharmaceutical companies and get a good deal for Kiwis both in respect to prices for uh, patented medicines and also in respect to generics. So generic medicines are where a, a medicine goes out of patent and then becomes available for anyone to manufacture and put into the marketplace. So th what they want to do is close off right, this ability to have generic medicines being produced and to extend again patents and copyrights in respect to medicines. The other area where they, want, where they are trying to attack our Farm Act is in respect to um, state-owned enterprises. So what the, the treaty negotiations in other treaties right, are doing is trying to make it more and more difficult for state-owned enterprises to operate in the public interest. Okay? So what they want is more and more uh, rules whereby state-owned enterprises are exposed to their site okay, and rules about state-owned enterprises not competing in the marketplace against cor private corporations. Okay? So we... Um, we might be interested in maintaining our state-owned enterprises as viable, um, viable uh, entities and, for instance, probably everyone in this room would have voted under the asset sale uh, referendum in respect to the power companies not to sell the power companies off, right? at a guess, or 95% of the people in this room or whatever. Um, so... There, they were a state-owned enterprises under state ownership and the push is to push, put those out in the marketplace and not have them right, as state-owned enterprises. This is the general thrust of large corporations and some of these governments in respect to TPP. One of the more serious problems that we have with... Um, um, TPP is where a corporation has an investment in our country or in one of the other countries that's covered by this agreement. And for instance, our government might say, we want to legislate in the, in the interests of public health and to give an actual example in respect to uh, tobacco. Right? So in respect to tobacco, New Zealand has entered into, um, has gone for Smoke Three 2025, which was an agreement between the National Party and the Maori Party for um, guarantee of supply in the, as a result of the 2011 election. Okay? And the government then agreed with the Maori Party that, yes, we'll put Smoke Free 2025 in place. Now, part of that package is about legislating for plain packaging of tobacco. Okay, so that instead of having the Marlboro Man or whatever else on the front of the tobacco um, package, it's plain. And so it's the corporations in this instance can't use sexy advertising to sell their products to our youngsters and get more kids hooked into tobacco smoking. That's the whole idea and psychology behind the plain packaging project. Now, <coughs> in Australia, they've done the same thing because it's not just a New Zealand thing, it's an international thing to, under the Tobacco Control Convention, which is... Right, which is a, part, is a World Health Organization agreement that's been negotiated and agreed between 50 countries, including Ireland and Ecuador and various others, okay, to put these things in place to reduce the uptake of cigarette smoking amongst our young. Okay? So this is a public health measure 
put in place by the government or supposedly put in by, place by the government. In Australia, the large um, tobacco company called Philip Morris doesn't like that and sees its profits being diminished and it's, seeing, um, it's losing value in respect to not having its brand and logo out there. And so it is suing the Australian government under a free trade and investment agreement that Australia has with Hong Kong. And in these free trade and investment agreements, and there's quite a number of them scattered around the world between countries, a lot of them have something in them called investor state dispute settlement. Okay? And this is where an investor, so a corporation, can sue a government right, where the government has taken action which has diminished the corporation's profitability or expropriated, taken away from the corporation something, okay, for whatever reason. Okay, generally when governments do that, they don't do it for a light reason, they do it because they feel they need to do it for whatever reason. Okay, so within, within respect to the, the tobacco control uh, measures, they're all done with the public's consent and agreement, largely. Okay? Now, <coughs> our government, right, in 2012 said there's no problems with us legislating for um, smoke-free 2025 and the plain packaging. So that was actually a quote from John Key. In 2014, after that went through the Parliament for its first reading, right, which happened in January or February of last year, he then parked that legislation and said, I'm putting it on hold and I'm going to wait and see what happens with the case by Philip Morris against Australia. And there's another one by them against Ecuador as well. Okay? Now, it's interesting that our government will delay and defer putting in place this important piece of legislation. Because every year that he delays or defers, then that would be another group of kids that take up tobacco... Oops, sorry take up tobacco smoking, possibly, that wouldn't have if this plain packaging and smoke-free legislation wasn't in place. Okay? Now, <coughs> he doesn't mind using urgency to, to move other legislation through the parliament. In fact, last year, it was very important that New Zealand all of a sudden legislate in respect to the countering foreign terrorist fighter legislation bill in November and December. Like we only had a couple of days in order to put submissions to the select committee and it was all a big rush and then it pushed it through and all of a sudden there's more alterations and rules about passports and all the rest of it, further infringements on everyone's civil rights on account of this global war on terror. So he used this urgency provision which is available to any government, to push that through. My question is, if that's the case, why wouldn't he use similar urgency to push this very important public health measure through the parliament? Right? Now, that's a rhetorical question. You've probably got your own answer as to why he wouldn't do that. Okay? But without us being party to a free trade agreement with ISDS provisions we are already being chilled and limited in respect to our government legislating in the public interest. So without us being party to an agreement which would stop us you know, legislating for smoke-free, he's stopping or deferring it. In TPP, right, New Zealand has already agreed to the ISDS provisions. Right? Our New Zealand negotiators haven't shown a backbone. They've said, yes, we'll agree to ISDS. And we can see as we go further and further down the track to a global world of a lot more people and a lot more industrial pollution and a lot more taxing of resources that there's going to be 
a lot more desire by large corporations to come in and stuff up our environment. Right? By drilling, by mining, by setting up their operations in different places, all of these different things, we're seeing that we, our community interest, is being put on the back burner and corporate interest seems to get promoted. Yeah. So this is very problematic. And so this provision in TPP called the Investor State Dispute Settlement is very problematic and needs to be stopped in our view. You make up your own mind. Now, there is another free trade and investment agreement that New Zealand has just signed up to. Okay? And this might help me to explain the process whereby we enter into free trade and investment agreements. That is the New Zealand-Korea free trade agreement. So it's, it's not a multilateral, it's a bilateral between two parties. And just by way of indication, there's something like 3,000 of these operating around the globe between different company, countries. Right? And increasingly, what we're seeing under these bilateral agreements is first world countries, so that's developed countries, using the ISDS provisions within them to kick shit out of the developing countries. Right? And push them around and make them open up their environment, their air, um, regions for first world corporation development. Okay, so that seems to be what's going on. Or that's, a, that's an observed pattern and that is evidence and proved. Okay? Now with the New Zealand Korea Free Trade Agreement, um, it also has investor state dispute settlement. And so what we've come to is if we're going to oppose investor state dispute settlement in TPP, it's very difficult for us to accept it in the New Zealand Korea Free Trade Agreement. And so effectively what we want to do is draw a line in the sand. Right? Draw a big furrow in the sand and say no more. Now to assist us in this process there's a number of things going on but you can assist also. With free trade and investment agreements they are not subject to ratification by the Parliament. Okay? Any of these free trade and investment agreements are international treaties and international treaties in New Zealand are entered into by the Crown using the executive. And in New Zealand's case the executive is the cabinet. Right? So it's the cabinet of the government that would make the decision. However, where a, an agreement or a treaty is inconsistent, where it's inconsistent with our domestic legislation, then that domestic legislation would have to be altered in advance before they can assent to the treaty. Okay? So there would be a process where any legislation that doesn't line up would have to be adjusted before the treaty could then be agreed to and signed off on a Monday by the Cabinet. Okay? Now, if we can stop the ISDS bill by way of legislation in New Zealand, then that would make our legislation inconsistent with, um, with what's being asked for in the treaty. And that opportunity is available to us. Because New Zealand first... Their member, Fletcher Tabato, who's based around Rotorua, he put in a private member's bill into the ballot called the Fighting Foreign Corporate Control Bill. Okay? Now that Fighting Foreign, co uh, Foreign Corporate Control Bill basically says New Zealand will not enter into a free trade and investment agreement that has ISDS provisions. Now, if that becomes an act of parliament, that becomes our law. And that would make our law inconsistent with what's being agreed in the free trade and investment agreement. Okay? So it's very important that this bill, right, 
is dealt with properly and agreed to by the Parliament because that may solve a number of our problems in respect to these free trade and investment agreements or some of them in respect to investor-state dispute settlement. Now, it was only in there for a couple of weeks, the bill, in the ballot, and then on the 19th of March, a Thursday, so it's Thursday every fortnight, if there's a space on the bills, on the papers, on the, on the business paper of the parliament, then they will draw the right number of bills out, okay, so it's by chance apparently, and, and then they fill up the space on the business paper. Now on the 19th of March, someone was looking after us because one of the bills that got drawn out was Fletcher Tabato's private member's bill. So it's out and active. Okay? So it needs 61 votes... 60, I haven't got enough fingers. 61... Six, anyway, 61 votes in the parliament in order to get it up. So with... And we know after the Northland by-election, and this is why this becomes very important in our considerations... After the Northland by-election, there's been a slight change in the numbers in Parliament and so our friends from National have only got 59 votes. Right? And they need two other votes to make any legislation work because we've currently got a Parliament of 121 members. Okay? So they need 61 votes to pass any legislation. So they need both the Act guy and they need either Peter Dunn, our friend, or the two, one of the two votes from the Maori Party in order to carry legislation, or the Labor Party, or whoever else. But effectively, they're a little bit more limited than they were in relation to, uh, relationship to the passage of uh, business through Parliament, or legislation through Parliament. But from our side, we need New Zealand First, we need the Greens, both of whom will support the bill. Right? We need Labor. Right? Now, Labor is a, very, is a very interesting kettle of fish because they are a free trade party right? and are still... La a lot of Labor is infected by this neoliberal uh, ideology. So they are having a big argument inside their party about what they're going to do with this. However, they have said on the public record that they will agree to voting for... Fletcher Tabato's bill for the first reading, which means that it's going to get debated. We also need the Maori Party, who have also said that they will uh, agree to the first reading. We need Peter Dunn, who I don't know that he's said anything yet, though I haven't had a chance to look at papers or anything for the last few days. I've been driving around madly. Um, so, and possibly we could talk to the ACT guy as well. So it would be really good if we could get that bill to its first reading. Because if it does, then it goes before the Select Committee, which is the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Select Committee, where it, it would be debated and it would be open for public submission. Right? And that's where you and I can write to them and put evidence to say that ISDS is no good. Right? And we would hope that you people would participate. Now, not only that, wait until the ISDS bill comes along, you have an opportunity to do this right now. Because with the New Zealand Korea Free Trade and Investment Agreement, right, that is before the Select Committee at this very moment. And it will be before the Select Committee only up until the day before ANZAC Day the 24th of April. Okay, so you've got two weeks, right, well, not even two weeks now, right, in order to get something in there. Now, on all of those bits of paper that are being passed around, you will find a website, itsourfuture.org.nz. Now, if you want the easy way to put a submission before the uh, the select committee in respect to the New Zealand Career Free Trade Agreement, just go to that website and there'll be a big page opens up and saying, put a submission into the, the select committee, right? And then you'll be able to go down the page and put your name and address, phone number and identify who you are and put your submission in 
and they have, they are, have made that really easy for people to do that minimal thing. But if you are got a little bit more time and you want to spend a little bit more effort on it, then you can actually put in a larger paper to the select committee yourself. And the other thing we would encourage people to say is that they want to be heard. Right? Not only am I just putting this piece of paper before you saying this, also you should say, I want to be heard. I want to go and explain to you why I feel that this is important, that you don't support ISDS in respect to these free trade agreements. Okay? So that's, that's the ISDS stuff and that's the New Zealand um, Korea Free Trade Agreement and it's very important that people do that, um, do something in relationship to that. Now, as well as that, we've been wor working <coughs> to try and get the public engaged in these, in these discussions and negotiations about what's going on with TPP because the government is not telling you. The government is not wanting to share anything about what's going on. If you have a clue about it, then you may know to go and have a look at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade's um, website and you'll get a little bit of information. But the government is not putting out a lot of information about TPP nor about what it's negotiating. These things are done in secret according to them. Because if we disclosed what our negotiating position is, then everyone would know and, well, we might not get the best deal that's possible. But in keeping it a secret, right, then they effectively keep us out of the loop. And then we don't know what's being negotiated. And then all of a sudden they come along and they announce, oh, we've just done a new free trade agreement with China. That's great, right? That's what happened in 2007 or 8. We had a new free trade agreement with China. And <coughs> unfortunately, that was negotiated by the Labor Party and they put ISDS in that agreement. And you know why? Because we needed to protect our dairy interests if they set up shop in China because Chinese law may not be strong enough to protect our investors' interests over there in China. So this thing about ISDS is really problematic. Like our government is using it to say to us we're protecting our corporation's interests overseas. But really they're not facing up to the reverse about overseas corporations especially USA corporations who are very, very um, um, prone to suing, right? Litigious, I think is the word. And um, they're not, really it would be better if we didn't have these ISDS provisions at all and any of these things just come under our New Zealand law. So if there's an issue, it's the New Zealand courts that deal with it, right? And they deal with it on the basis of New Zealand law and New Zealand law has been developed uh, supposedly in consultation with the New Zealand population and then the New Zealand population understand what's going on. But no, it's been taken out right, and put into these tribunals. They're overseas. They are not law courts. They're not law courts. The only reason they operate is because we give them jurisdiction in these agreements. Okay, so let's come back to... So they're not telling us about these things. So how do we grapple with it? How do we develop public awareness about it? How do we tr stop what's going on if we don't agree with it? And it was interesting for us because I come from Mochuaca and I was part of a small environment group called the Renewables and we were very concerned about the issue of climate change. But like that's our, that was the renewables rationale for being is this issue of climate change. Okay? And I think every day that goes by we get more and more indication that we're actually done something. Us, we 7 point whatever, 7.2 billion inhabitants of Earth, mostly in Western nations 
who have done the damage, but we, through our industrial pollutions, our emissions to atmosphere, are actually driving the climate in a way in which we, if we keep going the way we're going, we're going to find it hard to put the brakes on and slow it down. And so we don't just want to adapt to the changes, we actually want to mitigate, that is, cause there to be less carbon emissions to atmosphere. You put a CO2 molecule into the atmosphere, it will stay there for a thousand years. Right? So, and we are a long way above where we were at the start of the Industrial re uh, Revolution in respect to the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere. A lot of it's going to ocean. Right? That has the effect of acidifying the ocean. Right? And then you put that together with our willingness to drive around in large trawler boats and long liners and all the rest of it, and we're taking a lot of fish out of the ocean, like we're upsetting the balances all over the place. But in respect to climate change, it's a real problem. And we in the renewables said, well, what are we going to do about this? What can we do? And it was funny because we then became aware of a development in Auckland with the Auckland City Council. The Auckland City Council in, in 2012 was addressing TPP and it developed a policy response to TPP and you may have that now in front of you um, and your copy will be made out towards the Ta Taronga City Council, okay? But, or if there wasn't enough to go around it might say Hutt City Council but don't worry about that. Um, now that that resolution or policy statement is effectively the policy statement that was developed by Auckland Council in December of 2012. Okay? And TPP was pretty hot then because the TPP negotiators from the other nations were in Auckland meeting to have their negotiations. Right? To, and so Auckland Council was really focused on it. Now, that was all well and good because they've carried this resolution which says the New Zealand government in negotiating TPP must have these things in mind and look after these things. So it's a prescriptive policy which says that we have to look after council's ability and um, our, our New Zealand um, government and council's ability to procure and look after the public interest. Um, if we run through the various points in it, just very quickly, I'll grab my goggles because I need them. Maintain good trade and diplomatic relations with China because that's not part of TPP. Um, that if we're going to have a free trade agreement because we want to get better access for our agriculture into the US market who aren't free trade, right? we are free trade in New Zealand. We have tariffs of 5% and 12% on a couple of things. Everything else is zero tariff. In the New Zealand-Korea Free Trade Agreement, which is about 1,086 pages, right, and you, a whole lot of schedules, you go through it, our 5 and 12% tariffs are going to get given up in one or two years, right, in this agreement, right? And that's only on a few products. All the rest of ours are free. There's a whole list of Korean products which have tariffs on them, like in terms of our exports going into Korea, and those tariffs will come off over a much longer period of time, up to 15 years. Okay? So that may seem as though it's an unfair bargain, but it may be also okay from the point of view of, well, we've got nothing to lose from the point of view of our tariffs because everything can come into New Zealand effectively tariff-free except for those couple of things, okay? So <coughs> to get our agricultural products into the US market, for instance, would be a real boost for the dairy industry, right? But the problem there is that is the whole selling point of our New Zealand government in respect to what are the benefits of this agreement. All they're talking about and the whole focus is, is about our dairy exports and we're having problems in Canterbury and in other places where dairy is because it's not a clean industry, it's mucking up our waterways 
So we have to be really careful about further expansion of the dairy industry and putting, if you like, all our trade eggs into the one basket, right? Because we all know, or if we've, like there's a lot of grey-haired people around here, we'd all know that over time we see that resilience comes from having ourselves diversified, not just all our eggs in one basket, but in a diverse and rich economy where there's lots of different things that we're making and making for ourselves as well as making for export and overseas. <coughs> the fourth point in the resolution is about looking after Pharmac. The fifth point is about no ISDS. So we've already covered that pretty extensively. The, th the next one is about not extending uh, copyright laws. The, th the next one is to make sure that we're looking after our public services and are not allowing further privatisations like what's happened with the asset sales and like what's happening now with a lot of councils in terms of their public housing. Christchurch City Council's been put under enormous pressure by central government. Now you would think that the Christchurch earthquake and the situation in, in Christchurch is a national matter, not just a Christchurch city matter. But out of that, right, the, the central government is able to push an agenda whereby Christchurch City Council is being forced to dis uh, or to let go of its public housing assets. And it was one of the few councils that never got rid of them um, 10 or so years ago when there was a number of councils that did get rid of their public housing. <coughs> we want to be able to, in the eighth point, look after the local economy. In the ninth point, we want to make sure that our standards are being met and maintained. Um, in the tenth point, in respect to environment and biosecurity. In the eleventh point, in respect to tyranny. And in the last point, to make sure that you people get properly consulted before the government enters into any final and binding agreement. So that resolution was developed by Auckland Council. And it's quite, like we feel it's quite a good thing. And most people, when they look at it, uh, seem to agree. It sort of covers our concerns about what's being negotiated in these free trade agreements. And so what do we do with that? Well, our champion, who's a person by the name of Jane Kelsey, a professor of law at Auckland University, she came down to Nelson with that resolution and she said, look what Auckland's done. And people in Nelson said, oh, that's a good idea. I wonder what if uh, our Nelson council will agree to that. And they went and said, knocked on Nelson's door and Nelson said, piss off. <laughs> so they went back and they said, all right, well, we're going to have to push harder. So they did. And after a big lobby, right, there was a whole lot of people, 70 or 80 people in the council chamber on the day that they finally determined it. And they voted, oh, I can't remember the vote, but a, an overwhelming majority voted in favour of, that, favour of that resolution. And that was July 2013. So the next thing is, is the renewables then pushed it on to the Tasman District Council. Okay, so we started that process, well, the, the Golden Bay Community Board started it, but then we picked it up and ran with it from September and then finally got a decision out of the Tasman District Council, I'll get rid of those again, in, in March of last year. And then we said, all right, well, that's good. We don't have much more influence than Nelson and Tasman, coming from Ochoaca, what do we do next? So we wrote to all councils. So that document that you've got there, dated the 20th of March, is the letter that we wrote to all the councils in New Zealand, all 78 of them. And then I then tagged along on a speaking tour run by Kafka, Murray Horton, and actually came to this place in May of last year and spoke. There was a couple of people I recognised that were there then. Uh, at, that, um, at that meeting and he spoke about his, his lecture was who's running the show and in whose interests and the short answer was not us and not ours. Right? Now I've tagged onto the, 
tail end of that and just spoke a little bit about where we were up to with our TPP campaign. And at that point in, in May, I only had Auckland, Nelson, Tasman to tell the people here about. But since then, in August, Christchurch City Council picked it up and endorsed that resolution unanimously. Not only that, they asked for local government New Zealand to also pick it up and endorse it. And then, a couple of days later, on the 18th of uh, August, Dunedin City Council right, carried it. Now, that was a close vote, a big debate, and the mayor there, Dave Cull, he had to vote twice, right, so once in the, in the vote, and then he got to use his casting vote in order to get it across the line. But he voted the right way, it's all good. And then after that, I, I went up to uh, Wellington and had been working there for about four months prior to Christmas, went away for a little while and then came back again. And in February, Wellington City Council carried the resolution. In March, Hutt City Council carried the resolution. On the 8th of April, Upper Hutt City Council. So that became the 8th Council that carried this TPP resolution. Now if you have a look at the size of those council in terms of their territory and the population that they capture, and remembering that Auckland's like 1.2 million or something like that, those councils, territories, now represent roughly half the New Zealand population. Right? Like so that even though it's only eight councils out of 78, right, right, those councils roughly carry about half the population of New Zealand. We've got irons in the fire with a number of other councils, right? So on Thursday, I'll be back in Gisborne and talking to the Gisborne City Council. Uh, and at the same time in Kapiti, in Paraparaumu, there will be present presentations to the Kapiti Council and they have it on their agenda. So at Gisborne, we may not get a decision, but I think we definitely will in Kapiti. Gisborne, it's only, they're only early to it. Uh, we're also working with Napier councillors or people in Napier that are pushing their council and we're also working with the council here, right, or starting to push the thing onto the council here. Now, we, we wrote to the council and asked that I come along and make a presentation to their committee that was meeting today at 2 o'clock and they've fudged us off. But nevertheless, um, Tracy made a, a fine presentation yesterday to a committee which was the, called the S City Vision Committee and she presented for about eight or ten minutes uh, very eloquently and explained the position and then fielded a number of questions from councillors in respect to that. Okay? So uh, Tauranga Council um, are engaged but a little bit reluctant. They need some push in order for them to consider it further, we think. Okay, So uh, we'll keep pushing on, on your behalf, but it would be good if you know councillors for you to suggest to those councillors that they should be looking at that, uh, this TPP issue in a serious light and be looking after our interests. I don't know if there's councillors here in the room tonight or not, is there? They're all staying away? Yep. Okay, so <coughs> I can speak more openly maybe. Um, so yeah, you can push them along and suggest to them that um, it would be a good thing for the, the Tauranga Council to join the party and look to endorse this resolution and look after their public here. Because the thing that's been made known to me, especially in the agricultural belt up here between um, Hawke's Bay, Gisborne and here is that part of the way that agricultural producers are marketing their products is with points of difference. Right? They don't want to be just selling any commodity, they want to be selling a commodity which is valuable because it is clean, green New Zealand or it's been grown in this particular area or it's been grown in this particular grove. right? or it's not GE, right, or it's organic. And under TPP, if it's a carrot, 
and you break it and it's orange inside, you know, looks, smells like a carrot, all the rest of it. It doesn't matter whether it was produced using GE, conventional or organics. As far as TPP is concerned, we won't be able to differentiate in respect to labelling. So there won't be labelling to tell us that something's GE or not and there won't be labelling about country of origin because under TPP's rules they would see that as being discriminatory. Right? Because under TPP rules they would expect that if the regulations in Vietnam or the regulations in Chile or the regulators in the USA are the same as the regulators here and if those regulators are following the approved processes, they make a regulation and that says that that carrot's okay to eat, then that carrot's okay or that tube of toothpaste or whatever else, then that's good enough for everyone. Okay, that's the sort of approach. But particularly for marketing New Zealand produce, if we wanted to market on the basis of a point of difference, right, because of excellence or fine quality or that it's not GE, right, then we would not be able to under TPP. And it's also very interesting that at this very point in time, federated farmers are suing or are taking law cases against the decisions of Northland councils to endorse GE-free areas. Now it's activists in the anti-GE activists and many of them are Maori based, right, have lobbied their councils in Northland and got decisions by those councils to have no GE in those areas. Federated farmers are taking legal action to get that overturned. Okay? Now, well, that says to me, big clear message, that they want to be able to freely farm with GE crops in New Zealand. Okay? Now we know that also in Hastings there's been attempts to set up a GE free area as well. Now it's interesting, Mayor Yule in Hastings, and we're just starting to push on to Hastings uh, in respect to this TPP policy, Mayor Yule from Hastings is supportive of an anti-GE stance as we understand it. Okay? Now he happens to be the head or the chair, the political head of local government New Zealand. So that all the councils join together, a peak body is formed, that's called local government New Zealand. It has a national conference or council which has different mayors from different areas, um, but he's the boss, right? And it has an annual conference. Last year it was in Nelson in July, this year it's in Rotorua, okay, on the 19th to the 21st. One of the key note speakers at the local government New Zealand conference will be William Rolleston, who's the chair or head of um, Federated Farmers. So it's interesting, we've got Federated Farmers suing councils about publicly interested policies and they're also giving keynote addresses at local government New Zealand. Right? So, it's a very confused world that we're operating in right now. Okay. Oh, okay. So GE is genetically genetic engineering, and GMO is genetically modified organisms, and all of them mean that someone hasn't used traditional tra tra plant breeding, but they've actually created the thing in a laboratory by switching genes right, between organisms, whether they've come from other plants or from animals or humans or whatever else. Okay, so that's what GE is about. It, there's all sorts of problems with it, right? Like there's all sorts of problems, but when, this isn't a GE discussion, so we would just assume that people have got a uh, perspective on it, okay? Um, now, I've given you a fair amount of information. I've got some instructions to stop at about 8 o'clock and we're going to close. We're just going to stop for a brief minute so she, um, Zana can um, move, do some stuff with um, cameras. 
but then what I'll do is open it for questions. Now I've got more stuff I can share, but it might be a good point to ask for questions or comments or anything else, okay? There is also, if you haven't picked it up, more paperwork that people can pick up and read. Um, and one of the papers is important from the point of view of local government, news, uh, local government, and that is a paper which addresses some of the concerns specific to local government. And that's been produced by Bill Rosenberg from the Council of Trade Unions. And the others, like the resolution, and the other one's a resource document that people can go through and just, if they want to, they can go and look at those links. If people are really keen to get it and look at the links, I can give them um, digital copies um, and people can access me just via my email address, which is gregfullmoon013 at gmail.com. And it may be on some of the, uh, I think it's on uh, some of the paperwork as well. Uh, it might be on the letter to, the, uh, to all local government, for instance, uh, up the top. I think. Uh, no, it's not. But, um, but anyway, it's Greg Full Moon, all lowercase, um, 013 at gmail.com. Happy to get uh, people's comments via email. And if you want digital copies of that stuff, I can give you those digital copies, okay?